you're watching UNI TV. The Panther basketball team may have lost last weekend, but don't worry, we have a nice warm shoulder for you to cry on. Welcome to the Prowl. The passion, the purple. This is the Prowl. Welcome back. First up on this edition of the Prowl, we take it to our field reporter, Drew Hayes, who brings us a look at the UNI club tennis team. Have you ever wanted to know more? Uh, I'm Grant Pomerank. I'm a senior accounting major and this is my fourth year in the club and I'm also the president. I joined because I love tennis and I didn't really want to give it up after high school fully. And uh, I walked into a meeting this past year and I kind of just was asked to be the president. And so here I am. fifth year here at U and I. Um, my major is elementary education, special and minor. This is my third year in club and I joined because I wanted to keep playing after high school and my friend was the president. Um, I think people should join club because we have fun, we travel. It's a good way to stay active and keep playing after high school. Um, even if you're not on the team and even if your skill level is not the best or even if it's really good, we take everyone. So it's a great way to keep playing. Uh, for practices, we warm up for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we go through about three or four drills, and that lasts us about an hour, and then for the last half hour, we play a little bit of match play, and then end up with a fun game at the end. So that way we get a good basis for matches, some actual gameplay, and some drills so you can work on fundamentals. We have a lot of fun at club, and uh, there's a lot of different variety of players, skill level, and we just kind of accept everybody. We, uh, I like to think of us as a big family. Uh, so for tournaments, we usually have about three or four in the fall and the same in the spring. And there's always two really big tournaments in uh, Missouri that, have, that are sectionals, which can lead to nationals. And we travel to Minnesota, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Kansas, just kind of all, all the way around the surrounding states. Um, and I try, to, I try to rotate the groups that go, just so everybody who joins club gets a chance to go and compete. And it's a really laid back atmosphere. Um, everybody's still competitive at least, but it's not as strenuous as what high school would be. Everybody's just kind of there to have a good time and just keep playing the sport that they love. To join club, you can like our Facebook page, um, you and I Tennis Club. We always post when we have practices and the time, and if they're canceled, if we have them. Um, in the spring, we play um, once, and then once it gets warmer, we'll play three times a week. Indoor practices are at Waterloo Blackhawk um, indoor courts at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. Grant, Hacho, Mitt, Kitty, Brian, Micah, Maddie, Nicole, Love, Beth, Russell, Evelyn, Lizzie, Brittany, Rudy. Go, go, you and I, Panthers. Here at you and I, there are many obscure groups that we feel we just don't know enough about. So we sent the Prowl's Riley Cosgrove to figure out exactly what is the you and I sword fighting club. I'm here today in the Unidome to talk to the UNI Sword Fighting Club. I didn't even know they were a club, but it turns out they meet here every Tuesday and Thursday for two hours. Let's go check them out. UNI Sword Fighting is a foam weapons fighting society. We're, it's sort of LARPing. We're more a sport than LARPing is. LARPing is where you have less padded weapons and you're just trying to touch people with them, really. We actually hit people. Um, that's the big difference between us and LARPing. The basic rules to Belgarth, which is what we do at UNI Sword Fighting, are 
if you get hit in it, you take it. That's the essential rule. So if you get hit in the leg, the leg's gone. If you get hit in the arm, the arm's gone. If you get hit in the torso area, then you're dead. Um, basically, the rules are if you get hit in an arm, it's gone. If you get hit in two arms, you're dead. If you get hit in two limbs at all, you're dead. So arm, leg, arm, arm, um, torso is death. Head does not count. There's actually tons of different game variants. Uh, the most popular is teams, where you're just simply with a group of people um, versus another group of people. You fight it in lines. So in a way, there's kind of positions, kind of like a uh, uh, defensive line in football, because you have the uh, the first defensive line, which is all your people with the shields and, and swords. Then you have your second line of defense, which is all your people with the spears and blades, the really long swords to poke and prod from, from long distance. And then behind there, you have kind of your safeties or your archers uh, slash quarterbacks kind of, who are, who are there to just get the, the arrow right in where it counts. And then from there, you just push in until you sack uh, the team, so to speak. My name is Cassie Polk, but uh, I go by Armada. Basically, anybody can join. You just walk up. That's how everybody that's here has joined our club. You just, they heard about it and they came to practice. And people here are really accommodating. We have a lot of loaner weapons for new fighters. And we'll teach you how to make your own weapons. And there are lots of veterans who will teach you weapon styles, um, fighting styles, anything that you want to know. Reporting in the Dome of Sword Fighting, this is Riley Cosgrove reporting for U9 TV's The Prowl. You hear, you hear the question, what is roller derby? On this week's episode, our own Samantha Castor got an overview of this fascinating sports craze. Roller derby is the craze that's sweeping worldwide, but it's been around for a lot longer than most people think. Leo Salter and Damon Runyon are credited with the basic evolution of the sport to its initial competitive form. Professional roller derby quickly became popular. In 1940, more than 5 million spectators watched in about 50 U.S. cities. In the ensuing decades, however, it predominantly became a form of sports entertainment, where the theatrical elements overshadowed the athleticism. Although some of the sports entertainment qualities such as player pseudonyms and colorful uniforms were retained, scripted bouts and predetermined winners were abandoned. But what are some of the basics of roller derby for those who don't know. I got a chance to talk to one of the push-up brawlers from the Cedar Valley Derby Divas to find out some more information. The main person you really want to watch is the jammer and she wears a star cover on her helmet and her job is to make as many passes around the opposing blockers on our track as she can in two minutes. Um, and each opposing pass that she, opposing blocker that she passes, she scores a point. Um, and whoever the jammer is that gets out of the pack first, the pack is the group of blockers, uh, she becomes the lead jammer and she can stop that two minute jam at any point. So if she uh, makes her first pass and scores four points and wants to stop it there, then she can do that. And a lot of times that's what teams will do so that we can uh, slowly increase our score while the other team does it. Modern roller derby is an international sport dominated by all female amateur teams in addition to a growing number of male, co-ed, and junior roller derby teams and was under consideration for the 2020 Olympics. Roller derby is played by approximately 1,250 amateur leagues worldwide. Nearly half of them are outside the U.S. Most modern leagues share a strong do-it-yourself ethic, which combines athleticism and the elements for camp. As of 2014, the Women's Flat Track Derby Association, or WFTDA, had 243 full member leagues. This has been Samantha Castle reporting for The Prowl. Stay tuned next week for a more personal look at roller derby. And now, let's head over to Austin Hansen, who is sitting down with Steve Schofield, the Assistant Athletic Director. 
Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Austin Hansen for The Prowl, and today we are sitting with Steve Schofield from the UNI Athletic Department. Steve, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Thanks, Austin. Yeah, uh, I'm Associate Athletics Director here at UNI, and I've uh, been here since about 2006 and oversee uh, a number of areas, but marketing and media relations and, and tickets and, and a few other areas as well. Awesome. Um, so what sets UNI Athletics apart from any other school in the Missouri Valley Conference or any other school in the nation for that matter? Uh, you know, Austin, I think the first thing that comes to mind is our success. Uh, we've got really quality programs and, and really quality coaches and, and student athletes in our department. Um, and I think the longevity of some of our coaches and, and that, that's really translated into a lot of success on the field and on the court. Awesome. Um, so from an athletic department standpoint, what are some of the biggest challenges you guys have had to face either this year or in the past? Uh, without boring you in all the details, budget is always an issue for us, you know, trying to stretch our dollars uh, as far as they can go. Uh, and I feel like we do a really good job of that and we get a really good return on our investment. Um, beyond that, I think um, uh, making sure we get as many people as possible to our games. That's always uh, a little bit of a challenge in this day and age especially. I think it kind of speaks to you and I's success that we have had some sellout crowds this year. We do have a big fan base, and we are a smaller school compared to some of the other state schools. Right, absolutely. And uh, it, it does not go unnoticed by our coaches and our athletes and the rest of our fans when those student sections are full. Um, if, if we can figure out a way to, to do that on a more consistent basis and not just you know, towards the tail end of the year like, a, like it was a little bit this year in basketball, um, that's only going to help everybody be better. And, and I think the students that come have a great time. You know, and it certainly helps when we're winning as, as much as we are right now in men's hoops, for example. But uh, that, that has a big part in what we're doing. Definitely, yeah. I always enjoy uh, going to the games. I'm part of the Panther Pep Crew. Um, if you had any advice to, uh, if you could talk to the student body right now, yeah. uh, what, what would you tell them about you and I athletic events and like uh, why why should they care? Why should they go? Right. I think I think people really need to appreciate what we have going here right now. Uh, and it's easy to point to men's basketball, but football is consistently good. Uh, volleyball and wrestling are both top ten in the country from an attendance standpoint and a competitive standpoint. Top twenty five programs. So, I really think uh, they should really appreciate uh, what we have and and uh, come over and be a part of it. I mean, this is a high, high level Division One program we've got right here. Doesn't cost them a thing uh, but their time. So uh, the more we can get in our buildings, the, the more successful we'll be. Definitely, definitely. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, a new show this year to you and I, Comcast Sportsnet, um, as well as the UNI Athletics website, you uh, and I All Access, which follows the men's basketball team. Tell me a little bit about that. It's it's been a great thing for our program, and I think for the university as a whole. But uh, just to to show those guys behind the scenes, um, and and see what it's like to be in the locker room and to be on the road with the players is has been nothing but positive. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sitting and talking with us today. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to the, some postseason basketball and several other UNI sports to come. Uh, back to you guys. While many students enjoy a typical sport like basketball, one unique sport that is getting noticed at UNI is racquetball. Our own Andy McCarroll went on the prowl to learn more about this sport. I'm coming to you from the Wellness Recreation Center at the University of Northern Iowa. Today, students are enjoying racquetball. Now, many of you may be asking, what is racquetball? Racquetball is like tennis, um, except you're in a 20 by 20 box. The ball's flying everywhere, and you have split, set, or split decision to hit it. Racquetball is a sport that requires a racket, much like tennis. The only exception is you have a wall, and the ball you hit against the wall, and then you return the ball against the wall, and you try to out-wall ball your opponents. <laughs> While racquetball seems like an easy game, that doesn't mean that it comes without its dangers. My favorite part is not getting hit in the head. <laughs> I tend to get hit in the head a lot. Goggles um, always seem to be in the way for me, even though it's very important to wear your goggles. It's a safety concern, because if you get a ball right in the eye, it's not good news. However, the goggles always seem to get in my way and are usually the reason why I lose, which isn't very often. Racquetball also serves as a great workout for someone looking to get in shape or just simply trying to stay conditioned for any other sports that they may play. In the end, it's going to help you because uh, racquetball is making your workouts, getting you uh, 
quick movements. So like basketball, if you play basketball, it's a good workout. I play, I play hockey for the UNI club team here, and um, racquetball helps me with my hand-eye coordination, um, as well as my agility, my footwork, and just um, keep me in shape. So. Racquetball is a great game to play, and truly doubles with excitement. I would definitely recommend it to other people. It's a fun, easy sport, um, easy to learn, pretty cheap to buy the balls and racket and glasses. So I would definitely recommend it to others. Oh, yeah. Racquetball is a great sport. I think it's underrated. I think a lot of people don't exactly know how to play it. They just think it's hitting a ball against the wall, which kind of it is. But um, yeah, I recommend racquetball to anybody looking for a good exercise. Um, it's in a small room, so there's not too much area to run around in. The ball doesn't get lost. It just stays in one confined area. Play racquetball. It's a good time. If you guys can, come out and play racquetball. It's, it's a lot of work and exercise. If you, you know, ever want to lose some weight or something, it's a good Good way to start out, but uh, you know, if you want to have fun, it's a good sport to play. If you haven't already played it, racquetball is certainly worth any student's time. From the WRC, I'm Andy McConnell for UNI TV's The Prowl. Welcome to the UNI Roundtable. I'm Ian Shohanek. I'm Andy McConnell. And I'm Mike Weeb. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the NFL draft and some of our player or team's needs. And we're going to be also talking about players from Iowa and baseball and our World Series picks and Dark Horse picks. So, who do you guys think is going to, uh, you know, your teams are going to take? Um, right now, um, my team is the Dallas Cowboys, and the biggest thing in the uh, talks right now is what are they going to do between DeMarco Murray and Des Bryant. <coughs> As of yesterday, Des Bryant just got signed on to a franchise tag, which is definitely going to help the team, but also going to put in a tough position if they want to keep DeMarco Murray. Are they going to look for another running back? Um, of course, there's a uh, wide market for running backs this year in the um, I I the uh, draft. There's some really good talent we're going to see, and I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what comes for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Well, see, I'm a big Green Bay Packers fan, and we just got rid of two of our middle linebackers in A.J. Hawk and Brad Jones. So I'm thinking more in the draft, we need to go after a middle linebacker. And also, our probably our second-best wide receiver, Randall Cobb, he's – Tempted to leave him free agency, we didn't franchise tag him, so we could be looking toward the wideout position also in the draft. Wideout would be a good position for you guys. Uh, I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan, so right now I think our main uh, needs are offensive line and defense. So personally, I think we should go after uh, the linebacker from Nebraska, you know, Randall Gregg or whatever his name is. I can't really think of it, but you know, I know he's really good. So uh, you know, we also need a running back. So. We could take like Tevin Coleman or David, you know, David Johnson. That'd be great. Um, so, yeah, let's talk players from Iowa. Yeah, speaking of David Johnson, um, obviously people that have watched last week's show know I'm a big fan of the work that the uh, Panthers alum has been doing. And recently, uh, this last week at the combine, he made a tremendous mark. Uh, his career of over 5,000 yards um, at U and I really shows the strengths and what he is able to do as far as scanning the field, looking for holes, and just uh, making his marks. Made a tremendous uh, mark at the combine with his vertical, set the uh, <coughs> there. And um, so yeah, David Johnson, my man. I, don't, I, I honestly could see Johnson probably going to like the third or fourth round. I think being from such a small school, all the combine can do is help him. Yeah. So. I could easily see him going um, probably third, fourth round. Currently ranked fourth in all running backs at the Combine. Um, like I said, amazing stats. Uh, Ian, what do you guys say about I think talent? Third, you know, David Johns could be a third or fourth round pick. Um, I'd like to see you know Xavier Williams go in like the, uh, he'd probably go in like the fifth or sixth round. He could be a good pick for somebody. I think Xavier Williams is an underrated player. I just don't feel like he gets enough um, effort, you know, okay. does enough, not enough, enough word on the streets about um, Xavier. So, um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the NFL here, and we're going to go ahead and uh, move on here. D do you like skiing snowboard? Do you like to stay active in the winter months? If so, here's an inside look at the UNI Ski and Snowboard Club. <laughs>
Hi guys, I'm Shane Romsa. I'm the advertising head for the exec board for the UNI Ski and Snowboard Club and also the founder of the club. Um, I started skiing when I was 10, 11 out at Snowstar uh, down near the Quad Cities. And then I went to Colorado and I've been going to Colorado every year since, probably about eight, eight, nine years now. Um, let's see, I started out going with uh, Iowa State when I went to college. And then I kind of just decided that I wanted my own club here at UNI to go with people from UNI. So I started UNI Ski and Snowboard Club about uh, two years ago now. And it's been a great experience. Uh, we've been out to uh, Lutzen, Minnesota this past winter break, which was awesome. Uh, went with about six, seven people. And it was a great time. And then we went to Aspen last year during spring break. And that was just an amazing trip. Uh, you get to meet some really cool people. Um, none of us knew each other when we were out there, but we were all great friends at the end. Slopes were awesome, powder was great. Um, if you've never been to Colorado, it's an experience. It's worth joining a club just to be able to go out there, ski, snowboard, whatever you do. Um, along those lines, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, you can be a beginner just wanting to learn. We have people who are willing to teach you. Um, if you an, are an expert, come on out. We'd love to have you out there. And it's really just a fun experience, guys, for really any of you who just want to enjoy the winter time with some cool people. So I hope you come along. We're going out to Telluride this year uh, for spring break. Should be awesome. Two weeks ago, we went to Chestnut and Galena, and we, it was our second competition of the year. And there were nine total snowboarders in our field, so we had three out of the nine, so we had a third chance to win or like to place, like awesome for us. It was grand solemn again and there were two races, so we each went down twice for each race. We had a total of four runs. And yeah, the first run, or the first race, Matt got second place and for the second race I got third place. So Northern Iowa brought home some hard work for like these bigger schools like Northwestern and it was actually kind of awesome. We made it to regionals here this past weekend. That was a blast, had an awesome time. We did fairly well, the weather, wasn't cooperating with us. Um, one of our guys literally got stopped going down the hill because of the blizzard going through with the wind gust. That same gust about knocked me on the face when I was watching him. So, um, but other than that, all the events went fairly well and we're gonna be able to go to Nationals here out in Bend, Oregon this next week. With a trip to Nationals, hopefully we can repeat this next year. We'd like to grow, we'd like to get even more teams going. Uh, men's and women's skiing as well as women's snowboarding. Um, it's, it was such a great time and I don't want anyone who wants to do that uh, miss out on such an opportunity. So it's, this past semester has been great with competition and the UNI Ski and Snowboard Club has been great to be a part of. From medieval combat to modern day sport. <laughs> Fencing is a sport from, it's been around for decades actually in different forms and it actually stemmed from sword play back in the medieval times and they actually used real swords and actually went to first blood and everything but now we use protected swords obviously as far as practices we have two practices a week we meet on wednesdays at seven here and we meet in the wrc lo lobby and then we go from there and get kit from upstairs and then come down to a racquetball court. And then on Sundays, we do 3 p.m. and meet in the same place and come down to the aerobics room we're in now. Next, I talked to Colton Balvance about why he initially joined this club. Yeah, so I guess I, uh, I wasn't sure when I first came to join the club. Um, I had never really been in a club here at UNI before. And January came around, it was the start of a new semester, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot. Um, so I came to one of the meeting, the first meeting in uh, January. I emailed Scott to figure out what time it was. And uh, when I showed up, everybody just kind of greeted me warmly. It was like I was already part of the group. Um, we hang out like we're one happy little family, and uh, they, they taught me everything about fencing. Um, it's become my favorite sport, and I love doing it, so. For more information, you can contact the Fencing Club at unifencingclub at gmail.com. This has been Avon Helgerson for the UNI Prowl. So what are the secrets of making the UNI men's basketball team rank in the top 10? 
talent, training, and the support of numerous fans. Tyler Morford reporting for the Prowl shows the impact the fans have on the game and the UNI athletics. <laughs> Cold weather does not stop Panther fans from supporting their team as the UNI men's basketball team heats up this spring. With their purple tickets, I asked a few Panther fans what they look forward to. The dunks. Dunks. I want to see more dunks. What are you looking forward to? The champions. Just enjoying the win. I'm looking for a victory and being here with my grandson and my son-in-law is a real special treat. Making a memory. Looking forward to seeing him scramble and play defense and frustrate their opponent a little bit sometimes. Go Panthers! Go Panthers! Go Panthers! Go Panthers! Go Panthers. The UNI men's basketball team is now ranked the top 10 in the nation. A major part of their success is the support of thousands of cheering fans and students who support their climb to the top. More than 6,000 fans enjoyed the game, while a few players and athletes gave their thanks. Hi, my name is Marvin Singleton, I'm number 12. I just want to thank all the fans out here who uh, give us, me and my teammates support throughout the whole year. I just thank all you guys for coming to every single game, supporting us, and packing up my house. Hey, this is, uh, this is number 10 set total. I want to thank you guys. And the and let you guys know the appreciation that I have uh, for, for all of you guys that come out and support us. Uh, you know, uh, Loud McLeod Center is, uh, is a lot of fun, so thank you. Hi, I'm Dion Mitchell, uh, I'm number one, and uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a lot of fun when we have a McLeod Field, and it uh, makes a lot of difference uh, when they're in there cheering loud, so it's a real, it's a big help. Thank you, Panther fans. Thank you, Panther fans! Thank you, Panther fans! Thank you, Panther fans! Thank you, Panther fans! You mean a lot. Thanks. This is Tyler Morford reporting for the Prowl. Go Panthers! One, two, three. Go Panthers! If you enjoyed watching the first hand look at the lives and successes of your UNI Panther sports teams, clubs, and other activities, find us on Facebook under UNI TV's The Prowl and on Twitter at UNI The Prowl and on Instagram at UNI The Prowl. For The Prowl, I'm Riley Cosgrove. And I'm Anton Ryder. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Go Panthers! <laughs>